We're talking about kingdom calling. We're talking about work, whether it's paid, whether it's volunteer, whether you're caring for someone, a loved one in your family or in your street or extended family member, uh, whether you are doing, uh, also encompasses ministry service, what we, what we give um, in our response to Jesus in and through the local church. But throughout the Bible, there's so many lived out testimonies of people who looked at their circumstances, looked at their resources and their own capacity and knew it was wasn't very much or it wasn't enough and I'm sure Jose going into this place going how are we going to feed thousands and thousands and thousands of people like I know how to feed a restaurant but how do I feed thousands like he would have looked at that situation and go there's not really enough (laughs) and in one sorry in two kings chapter four we can read of a woman who was married to a member of the group of prophets that studied and served with Elisha um And she came and told Elisha, my husband's dead. Um, These creditors have come and they're wanting to take my sons as slaves because in those days, women couldn't, outside of um, the male in their household, their son or their uncle or their father, they couldn't earn an income. And so they were wholly dependent on a male in their household to just be able to survive. And so, um, yeah, she comes to Elisha and says, my husband's dead. The creditors, there must have been an outstanding debt that my husband owed. These creditors have come and they're saying that they're going to put, take my sons as slaves if I can't pay the debt. And in 2 Kings 4.2, Elisha says, what can I do to help you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she says, nothing at all except a flask of olive oil. And the reality is that she didn't have much but she had something. And so Elisha says, take that olive oil, ask all your neighbours for jars and containers, go into the house with your sons and just start pouring. Start pouring. And as she poured, the oil flowed and it only stopped flowing when there weren't any more containers. And Elisha said, all right, now sell the oil and pay off the creditors, pay off your debtors and live on the rest. Pretty amazing because she didn't have much, but she had something. (laughs) <laughs> and that not very much in the hands of a miracle-working, way-making God became a great blessing. It not only helped meet a desperate need in her own life, it, it blessed Elisha, it demonstrated the glory of God's goodness and God's power. And you might be thinking as we're doing this series, Kingdom Calling, what I do, it's not very much. But you do have something to contribute and when you put what you do have and whatever work you do, when, even when it seems insignificant, when you put that into the hands of an almighty God, it has a far greater impact than you will ever know. We heard about the story with this woman. What about in Matthew 14? Jesus has just heard about the death of John the Baptist, his cousin, whom he loved so much. And so he's grieving And he gets in a boat and he wants to have some time by himself to just talk with his heavenly father. And he gets in a boat and he goes across the lake. And meanwhile, this massive crowd have heard that he's going across the lake. And so they travel by foot. And when he gets there and gets off the boat, it's not a solitary place. There's masses and masses of people there. And he, instead of just saying, what are you doing here? Leave me alone. (laughs) Has compassion on them and healed their sick. And Mark's gospel mentions the fact that he began to teach them many things. But late in the day, his disciples came and pointed out to him something really obvious. Jesus, it's late. (laughs) The disciples, it's remote. Send these people away so they can go to the surrounding countrysides and the surrounding villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus didn't want to send them away. He loved them and he cared for them, each individual in that crowd. And he said, do you know what? I don't want them to be fainting on the way home or to go and buy some food. I want to provide and care for them. And so Jesus replied, they do not, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We, only hear, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. And Mark, retelling the same event, records the disciples saying, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Well, how many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. And in John, we read from this, about this account, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would that go among so many? Like, Jesus, come on. 
Like even you, you're, you're powerful, you're amazing, but really, there's 5,000 men here, besides all the women, besides all the kids. There's probably like a crowd of, you know, at least 15,000 people, thinking of how many kids they had in those days. <laughs> um, and in Matthew 14, 18, there's a really telling um, uh, phrase that Jesus says, which I think God wants us to pay attention to this morning. He says, bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. And they all say, ate and were satisfied and there were 12 basketfuls of broken pieces left over. But that phrase that Jesus says, bring them here to me. He continually challenges and calls us to take notice about, take notice of and think about what we already have and bring it to him. So the first thing I really feel God's encouraging us with this morning is bring it what you have to Jesus. Bring what you have to Jesus. Because when you take what you have, which seems little or doesn't seem like much, and you put it in the hands of Jesus Christ, he can do amazing things through it. Things that you won't even know this side of eternity, the impact that it can have. In Romans 12.1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. What do you have? Well, for starts, you have a body with a heart and a soul and a mind. You have some sort of physical capacity, even if you can't do much, you have a body. (laughs) What if you took that body and you said, God, here it is. I don't want to live for myself. I actually want to live for you. Use all of me to worship you and point to who you are today. And what if you then actually said, what else do I have that you want to use today? What else do I have that you want to use today? Because we see lack. We see all the things that we don't have. We see all the things that we wish we did have. But God often starts What do you have? Tim Keller says, everyone will be forgotten. Nothing we do will make any difference and all good endeavours, even the best, will come to naught unless there is a God. If the God of the Bible exists and there is a true reality beneath and behind this one and this life is not the only life, then every good endeavour, even the simplest ones, pursued in response to God's calling can matter forever. Do you know, your work will never bring you lasting fulfilment because you are not made to work to live. You are made to live for Christ and to do the good works that he's prepared in advance for you to do. You're not made to work to live. That is not where your security and your identity is found. It's found solely in the one for whom you were made. And your work will never bring you lasting fulfilment It will never bring you purpose and transcendent meaning if you consciously or unconsciously make it the end goal. In Romans 12, 2 in the Amplified, it says, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is. So with that which is good, and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. And so bring what you have to Jesus, yes, yes and amen. But also be transformed by what you think. Be transformed by what you think. How we think matters a lot. It matters so much. It affects how we perceive, how we feel, how we choose, how we respond and act. And as Christ followers, the Holy Spirit is always at work to transform us to be more like Christ. And do you know one of the major ways that He does this is to change the way that we think about ourselves, about God, who God is, about the world around us, about other people. And as we open God's Word, as we read it for ourselves, as we accept its authority over our lives and ask Jesus for help to put it into practice, He renews our mind to think like Jesus thinks, more and more, to think like Jesus thinks. 
What is the pattern of this world? Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. What is the world's pattern in regards to work? The world's pattern is that it's survival, that you just get in and get out to put food on the table. The world's pattern is that it's for self-fulfillment. It gives you money, it gives you some sort of power, it gives you affirmation, it gives you praise from others. The world's uh, view of work is that it's for self-realisation. It actually shapes you and your identity. (laughs) And I really feel this this morning that God is challenging us to think about two different mindsets that we can adopt in the way that we view ourselves and our work. We can, we can continue in a poverty mindset. A poverty mindset is all about what I lack. It's all that I don't have. It's all that I'm not. A poverty mindset is all that is wrong with this situation. A poverty mindset is all that is impossible. But a possibility mindset is about what I already have. It's a faith posture. It says, what do I have that could be useful? What is all that I am because of Jesus? What is an opportunity to do good in this situation? I can't control lots of things about this situation, but I have an opportunity to do good. What is that opportunity? And what is all that Jesus is and can do because he's in my life? And I want to tell the story of Moses because when God got Moses' attention via a burning bush in Exodus 3, Moses' thinking was entrenched in this poverty mindset. It was entrenched in everything that he lacked. And what had happened? Well, God's people, the Israelites, had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And we read in Stephen's speech in Acts 7, It says, at that time, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. And then when Moses was 40 years old, he decides to visit his own people, the Israelites, and he sees this Hebrew slave being mistreated and Anger rises up in him and he looks around to make sure no one's watching so he knew exactly what he was doing. It was premeditated. And he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting and he tried to reconcile them. And he tried to say, guys, where are you fighting? You know, you're brothers. And they're like, who do you think you are? Are you going to kill us just like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses was horrified. He suddenly knew that many, many people knew what he'd done and Pharaoh would find out and arrest him and kill him. So he fled to Midian. And for 40 years, he worked as a shepherd, tending the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. This was a lot of time for him to do some reflecting. 40 years. (laughs) Perhaps Moses looked down on the Hebrews and thought he was the one who would bring them up to his level of superior intellect his moral character and his advanced learning. I mean, as a prince of Egypt, he would have learned much about administering the empire, about how to drive a chariot, about how to supply, march and lead an army, about the political skills necessary to succeed on the world stage. But there's no mention in the Bible that when Moses saw the Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew slaves that he asked God, that he prayed, that he asked for wisdom, what do I do now? (laughs) He acted presumptuously. He incorrectly saw himself as the deliverer and the hero of the story. We read in Acts 7.25, Moses thought that his own people would realise that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. D.L. Moody says, I have an idea that Moses started out with a great deal bigger head than heart. He'd been schooled and brought up with all the luxuries that Egypt could give him and now as a shepherd hidden away in the back six of Midian in the sight of the Egyptians, a shepherd was an abomination. (laughs) So he drops out of the public life for 40 years and I'm sure there would have been a great deal of discouragement and disappointment and regret that he had to process. But God had his eye upon Moses and through it all was teaching Moses an important lesson. God alone was and is and will always be the deliverer of his people. He will always be the hero of the story. 
like Laura reminded us this morning, through his son, Jesus Christ. And so through hard work and being content to serve without a claim or being in the limelight, God continued to shape Moses' character. And the practical skills he learned as a humble shepherd would not only bless his immediate family, they would be invaluable to the future work that God would have him join God in. Spiritual shepherding. God was preparing him. And so we read in Exodus 3, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, Moses. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But first, God needed to help Moses renew his mind. Because there were five excuses that Moses threw up that reveal this poverty mindset or this lack of that he had about how he saw the world around him. And these, to paraphrase them, look like this. I am not enough. I don't know enough. I don't have enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not confident enough. Does that sound like anything that you've ever thought? (laughs) I know it does to me (laughs) about some of the things that I've thought before. The five excuses he gives God reveal this lack that he saw in his own life and he wrongly assumed disqualified him from doing the work God had called him to do. And I believe many of us in this room, if we're honest, struggle with at least one of these lacks when it comes to thinking about the current work that we do or the future work that God's called us into. The first one, Moses says to God, who am I? And what he's actually saying, he's recognising his lack of worthiness. I am not enough. (laughs) But who am I to appear before Pharaoh, Moses asked God. Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God's answer is pretty much... You don't have everything it takes, Moses, because I am enough. (laughs) And I will be with you. And so we can reject that old mindset of I am not enough. If you are in Christ, you are complete through your union with him. He has made you holy and without fault in the Father's eyes. He has dignified you and given you great worth by laying his life down for you. We have a brand new identity in Christ that never changes and a God who never leaves us. So God's promise and his answer to some of the insecurities that we might think or feel sometimes is, I will be with you. I will be with you. And so we can embrace this truth. And I'm going to put some scriptures and um, some possibility mindsets up. You might want to take a screenshot if it's one of the ones that you think, yep, I want to really embed this and embrace what God says. Just pop that up, guys. It'll come in a minute. Oh, it's behind me. Good. Thank you. So you might, I'll get out of the way. If you want to, that's some scriptures that you can look up to embrace a possibility mindset. God will be with me in the work he has called me to do. God will be with me in the work he's called me to do. The next one that Moses chucked out there was, well, who is sending me? I don't know enough. (laughs) Have you ever felt the lack of experience or the lack of experience? you know, the fact that other people could do it better than you? Well, Moses thought it disqualified him. In Exodus 3, Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, 
Say to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. The same God, he was saying to Moses, I'm the same God that appeared to Abraham. I'm the self-existent one. I'm the eternal, uncreated, unchanging, absolute reality and creator of the universe. And God's name is packed with who he is and what he does. I am who I am. There was no start to me, Moses. There's no finish to me. I exist. I have, I'm, I'm God. <laughs> And he's the promise-keeping Lord of all and the faithful covenant-keeping God of Abraham and his descendants. And if you are in Christ, you are one of Abraham's descendants because the Bible says that Abraham is the father of faith. And if you are in Christ, you have put your faith in the God, the same God of Abraham who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Just think about that. I am who I am, the God, the self-existent one, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, the reality of the universe, the creator has drawn near to us, has come close to us in his son, Jesus Christ. He became flesh, he became human, he lived among us, Jesus. The word became flesh, the word and dwelt among us. And he didn't just come to live and experience what it was like to be a human and identify with our suffering. He came because he knew that there was this impenetrable barrier between us and a holy God and there's no way we could make it, bring, pull down the wall ourselves. There's no way we could cross the chasm ourselves. There's no way we could make ourselves good enough for a holy God. So he came near, he drew near, he came to us, lived a life of perfect obedience before the Father and then willingly chose to lay down his life. He died in our place, the God who created everything. He died in our place because he loves you and he has a purpose for your life. And after he died and was buried, God raised him powerfully from the dead. Jesus Christ is not just a figure of history. He's not just some person that's a religious icon. He's not just a, you know, part of someone's imagination. He is a real person and he is alive. And thousands upon millions of people across the world have testified to how they've come into a personal relationship with I am who I am, who has now revealed himself in Christ. And you can too. And when he comes into your life, he starts to change and reorient reorient what you value and what you think is important and you start to want to live how he uh, lived and serve people how he served people and love people and see people how he loved and saw people. And so God gives Moses this personal revelation of who he is. So Moses knows exactly who is sending him and what authority he has to undertake this work God is calling him to. So you might have had that poverty mindset, I don't know enough, I don't have enough experience. I don't know enough to represent Jesus. And God's answer to us is, well, I am sending you. (laughs) As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. In your day-to-day work, you can be an ambassador for Christ. So let's have a look at the... um, possibility thinking that is so important for us to embrace what the scripture teaches. Have Pop that up on the screen, guys. We can embrace the truth that I have a relationship with Jesus and he has sent me. I am his ambassador in my work, in my ministry service. I am his ambassador. When those little kids look into my eyes, may they see Jesus. Moses throws up another one. What if they won't believe me? I don't have enough. And so he's looking at his lack of resources. He's looking at his lack of credibility. And we can do that individually. We can do that in teams. We can do that in families. We can look and say, we don't have enough. (laughs) Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? And then the Lord asked him, what is that there in your hand, Moses? We often say, I don't have enough. I don't have enough to step out in the calling that God's given me. I don't have enough. 
you have something. If you have a home, you have a habitat of hospitality. <laughs> if you have a spare jumper, you have something that can clothe someone who doesn't have something to clothe themselves with. If you have a smile, you can give someone dignity with your smile. You can give a word of encouragement. If you know how to cook and you like cooking for your family, you can make a bit extra and give it to your neighbour. What do you have? Our Heavenly Father's answer to that thing that we throw up if I don't have enough is what do you already have? Start where you are and I will empower you and I will enable you. We can reject that lie, I don't have enough. Let's pop up that possibility mindset. Christ can be seen in my everyday work, in the way that I work, how I treat people and what I say. I will start with what I have and bring it to Jesus. And I trust that he will use it beyond what I could ask or imagine to bless others and extend his kingdom. A couple of weeks ago at our 5.30 service, Pastor Tanya Chesser shared about Doreen Oakley, who we have just had her memorial service and she's gone to be with Jesus, but talked about how she was so touched at the fact that Doreen knitted these beautiful little bears and would have a bag of them and she would walk around Westlakes and when she saw a mum who was in distress or a mum who was struggling, you know, the kids were going a bit ratty, she'd walk up and offer them this little bear to give the mum a little moment of respite and just to bless the kids. And she'd pray over each one. She knew that she could take what she has and use it for Jesus. Pretty amazing. Next, Moses throws up, what if I get tongue-tied with words? I'm not talented enough. He looked at his lack of ability and we do that too. Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been. Well, in Acts it says that he was powerful in speech and action. So yes, he once was, but he believed a lie. (laughs) I never have been, I'm not good now, even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then God asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say. So God's answer to Moses throwing up this I'll get (laughs) tongue-tied, is I made you and I will be with you in this work. I will be guiding you and giving you wisdom. And so we can reject this mindset that says I'm not talented enough to contribute. God doesn't say that about you. He says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Every person he's put in his body, the body of Christ, every person he's given gifts or abilities to, every person And if you're not currently serving in your local church family, can I encourage you? There's there's such a joy in being able to contribute. Don't look at what you don't have. What do you have? Do you have time? Do you have just a willingness to show up and do whatever? (laughs) We need to embrace the truth. God desires my availability over ability. He will help and empower me to outwork what he's called me to do. I can play my part. The last one Moses throws up is please send someone else. (laughs) I love how the Bible is so honest about this. And his thing is I'm not confident enough. And in the NLT it actually says Moses pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. (laughs) Not just someone else, just pick anyone as long as it's not me. And God provided Aaron to come and help him, but God doesn't often take away our nervousness. He doesn't often say, all right, I'm gonna, you have the courage to do what I've called you to do, but there's not gonna be any fear. He doesn't say that. <laughs> he doesn't say godly confidence is not the absence of uncertainty. There's gonna be some things you don't know, some things that you're unsure about, some things that you have to step out and trust in God working through you, and that's the whole point. Like he said to Moses, he's saying to us, I will provide for you and help you. And so we can embrace the truth of the word of God that says my confidence rests in Jesus working through me. I can do all things. Let's put that on the screen. Through him who gives me strength. I can 
Some of you need to go away and sit with these scriptures and make them personal and declare them back to God out loud and say, thank you, God. I am rejecting that poverty mindset of all that I lack and I am embracing all that I have in you and all that you can do in and through me. I want to finish with this. I was just thinking about what God can do with one surrendered life. It's astonishing. What God can do with one surrendered life. Think about Doreen. I just gave a small example, but with the surrender of Jesus, Think about the millions and millions of people that have come to know God as Father. It says in Titus that Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What about with the surrender of Moses? God said to him, what do you have in your hand? He says, a staff. It was a symbol of his occupation. It was a symbol of maybe his discouragement. Maybe it was part of his identity and his security. What did God say to him? Throw it down. Throw it down. As we surrender our lives to God, We can pick back up the work that he's called us to do with his empowering and his enabling, not in our own strength. We can throw down those poverty mindsets that trap us and block us from God using us. And we can surrender our current work to God and say, Lord, if there's any new ways that you want to use me, here I am. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are faithful to your word and it will achieve the purpose for which you send it out. Holy Spirit, would you just apply it now to every heart? Lord, I thank you that you give us examples in the scripture of ordinary guys like Moses who threw up a lot of excuses. (laughs) And we relate to that, Lord, because sometimes we can get stuck in that poverty mindset too. But I thank you, Lord, that you persisted with Moses. You didn't give up on him. And you instructed him and invited him to surrender. I thank you for every person here. Lord, if there's someone here who's never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, who's never put their hand in your hand, never said, okay, I recognise that I was made for God. I was not made to live for myself and I want to follow this God. But I can't do it in my own strength. Thank you, Jesus, that you've drawn near. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ or you're watching online I just want to invite you to be part of a prayer that I'm going to pray a prayer that you can pray to say Jesus I give you my life if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life you've never put your hand in Jesus hand you want to do that today would you just put up your hand God will see it and I'm only going to see it to include you in a prayer I'm not going to embarrass you or anything like that, if you want to pray that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. Just pop up your hand where you are. Thank you, Lord. If you're watching online right now, if you're saying in your heart, if you're putting up your hand, whatever it is, but you're responding to him, Jesus, I give you my life. Awesome, I see that hand. Is there anyone else here? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for those who are responding now and they're saying, Jesus, I give you my life. I put my hand 
in your hand. I give my little, what seems like the little of my life over to you. I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you've forgiven me and that you welcome me into God's presence. And I now have access to God because of Jesus. I receive you. I believe upon you. And I want to follow you. May your spirit come into my life and lead me from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.